Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namaham Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pricharine Nirvisay Shashanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavibio Namo Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Sri Advaita Gadata Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the Srimad Bhagavatam. We're on third canto, Kapila Shiksha. And today we're looking at chapter number 32. I don't know how, how do I get out of this. Recording stopped. I'm going to have to leave for a minute and come back. Can you enable me to share the screen, please? Welcome back, Maharaj. Yeah, sorry, I just have a problem with that. Recording in progress. Okay, so we're on chapter number 32. Okay, wait, that was the one I want. Connection with the previous chapter. We're still answering Devahuti's questions from the 29th chapter when she inquired that she wanted to hear about eternal time. So we heard some things of it. We did hear about the effects of eternal time and how it brought so much suffering 
for, for people in the mode of passion and ignorance. We heard about, <clears throat> we heard about taking birth again, the, the child in the womb taking birth. We heard about going to Yamaraj and being taken to, by the Yamaduras and punished by Yamaraj and then taking birth again and the child in the womb. What we did not hear, which we will be hearing today is, you can see Devahuti asks a question at the end of the, the last question, she says, uh, please also describe eternal time, which is a representation of your form and by whose influence people in general engage in the performance of pious activities. So we were looking mainly in chapter 30 and 31 about people performing sinful activities. So today, we, you know, we'll hear about people who perform pious activities and see what happens to them. Does that actually solve the problem? If we may not be devotees, but if we act pi with piety, will that change the situation? Is that going to save us? Here you can see chapter 30, we spoke more about tamagun, the tamagun, lust, anger, greed, violence, uncontrolled senses, these problems. We heard how people are very greedy, try to get more money and they do so many things. Then we heard also about the hellish planets or hellish punishment. The Yamadura comes to arrest the fallen soul and were punished in different hellish conditions. Here you can see, we may be born as an animal and later as a human being, come back gradually to the human form of life, go through different species of life according to our karma. So that was all in chapter 30. And then chapter 31, we heard about the child in the womb and the development of the the body in the womb. We heard about the suffering the child in the womb undergoes and how he becomes conscious after seven months and some pray, not all pray. Okay, the, 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 the soul suffers in the mother's womb, the prayers by some children in the womb. And, but then after birth, although they prayed when they were in the womb, after they come out of the womb, then they forget everything. They take birth, they've taken birth again and they're enamored by the material nature and they forget all about the suffering they went through in the womb and they try to enjoy the material world. And then we also heard in very powerful, a very powerful manner about the danger of bad association bad association, particularly uh, in the form of illicit connection with the opposite sex. And uh, people who are very much attached to these kind of things, that kind of association is very harmful for us. And then finally the chapter spoke about reclaiming our original spiritual nature. So we're going to go on today to hear about entanglement in fruitive activities. In other words, we, we desire to enjoy the results of our work. So people who perform pious activities, they have that tendency. They like to enjoy the fruits of their work. Here's the connection from the previous chapter. Having explained the results of condemned sinful activities in chapters 30 to 31, now Kapila explains the, the results of prescribed activities with material desire. Living in his house, he enjoys the results of the various dharmas, kama, arta and dharma, and again he performs those dharmas. And this is, these are the words of Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in his commentary to this section on Srimad Bhagavatam. So, because of our material desires, we're performing activities, we desire to enjoy the results of the work. 
So this is Karmakanda. You can see the path of Karmakanda beginning with material dharma. And the purpose of material dharma is artha. And artha, purpose of artha is karma. <laughs> so like that people get stuck in this kind of cycle, dharma, artha, karma. And they, they never get to moksha. That's one of the problems with the path of karma kanda, that they never get out of that. And then from Burijan Prabhu's uh, book on this section, in uh, his book Unveiling the Lotus Feet, he has written that although in chapter 31, Kapila Muni implanted fear in the heart of the listeners by describing the horrific results brought by the attempt to enjoy contrary to Shastric regulations. One may nevertheless wonder if one can be happy and avoid suffering and rebirth through pious, non-devotional following of Shastra. By delineating the results obtained by the followers of various paths of karma, Kapila Muni will answer that question. So Kapila Muni will answer, he's going to describe about different paths. Not everybody is a devotee, of course. Not everybody follows the path of bhakti yoga. So there are many different people. What kind of results do they get? We want to understand about the results of uh, performing some kind of actions, trying to, trying to show piety, trying to avoid suffering. Let's have a look and see what happens in this chapter. So Kapila Muni begins by first of all describing about the Sa Kama Karmi. The Sa Karma Karmi. In other words, <laughs> he's a karmi. And he's attached to material desires. But he's, 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 follow, he's doing activities according to Vedic principles. He's a you know, karmi. Karma is performing karma, which is prescribed in the Vedas. And he's doing it to enjoy the results. So what will happen to him? So he reaches the heavenly planets and he will enjoy his pious activities, and he will stay there as long as he has piety, and when it's finished, then he'll come back down again. That's the beginning of the chapter, that you, we, you can go to the heavenly planets, but you're not going to stay there forever. You just go up there according to the extent of your piety, and then you come back. But then Kapila Muni goes a bit higher, and he explains about the Niskam Karmi. The Niskam Karmi, he's not thinking about enjoying the results so much, but he wants to get out of the material world. He, wa he wants to actually get free from the results. So he advances towards the spiritual sky. He will go up to planets like maybe the sun or the moon, and from there then he will go on to Brahma Loka, the higher planets, and maybe with the end of Brahma's life then he will go to the spiritual sky. He's following Vedic regulations, but he's not trying to enjoy any results himself. He wants liberation. And then Kapila Muni tells us about people who worship Haranyagarbha. Haranyagarbha meaning, and it it, it's meaning Garbhodakashayu Vishnu. So they reach Satyaloka, the planet of Lord Brahma. And at the end of the life of Brahma, then they will also be liberated. They have to wait there. In other words, they have to wait for the end of Brahma's 100 years of his lifetime. And then at that time, when the whole universe is annihilated, then they can go with, maybe they'll go with Brahma and they may enter the spiritual sky. Or they may simply enter Mahavishnu. Sometimes 
Brahma also comes back. That is described verses 12 to 15. Without bhakti, no one can enter the spiritual sky. So it doesn't matter who you are. You may be Lord Brahma or you may be one of the four Kumaras, but if you don't have bhakti, you're not going to get into the spiritual sky. You're not going to get up free of the material world. Then 16, text 16 to 21, we'll hear about the Sakama Karmi, how he is condemned. Sakama Karmi, that was described at the very beginning of the chapter. The person who is performing some activities according to scriptures, but simply for his own sake, for his own pleasure. Then text, text 22 to 26, 26 describe the conclusion. And the conclusion, of course, is that you have to become a devotee. You have to do devotional service. And then the rest of the chapter, well, first of all, 27 to 38, you're going to, we're going to uh, hear Kapila Muni review what he's been teaching the basic results of astanga, jnana, bhakti, kala, and samsara. All of these different things which have been covered within this section of Kapilamuni's teachings. It will all be presented it's in a very brief manner. Because Kapilamuni's pretty much finished his teaching, he's just summarizing it. And then the the end of the chapter we'll hear who should be instructed in Sankhya Yoga. Just like in the Bhagavad Gita, at the end of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says who should get this knowledge and who shouldn't. So similarly with Kapila Shiksha, he's also describing who should be instructed in this, who's qualified to receive this. And then the final verse, the fruit, the falasruti, the fruit of studying this section of Kapila Muni you hear. All right, so we'll go ahead. Here's the first verse. Okay, the first verse. Uh, Sakama karma, chewing the chewed. <laughs> right? Chewing the chewed. Saka, that's sa, Sakama karmi. He's chewing the chewed. He's trying to enjoy, but there's no real enjoyment there. So Lord Kapila describes, the person who lives in the center of household life derives material benefits by performing religious rituals and thereby he fulfills his desire for economic development and sense gratification. Again and again he acts the same way. So. It's, this is the description of the Griha Medi, not Grihastas, but Griha Medis. Griha Medis, they want to enjoy their family life for their own pleasure. They have no spiritual purpose. They may perform religious rituals, but they perform them for material benefit. And so because they're doing religious rituals, they get results, they get economic development, and they have sense gratification. And this way they're thinking they're happy, but it's all temporary. They still are faced with the problem of old age, disease and death. They have to give up the body, they'll take birth again. And again and again they act the same way. You die in the mode of goodness, you will come back again in the mode of goodness. They, they didn't really make any spiritual advancement because their purpose was simply to enjoy the material world. And they were attached to the material world, so they come back into a similar situation which they left. And of course, they may even go down, they may even take birth in the lower species of life. It depends, it's very dangerous. We know from the Krishna Leela about Maharaj Nriga, 
he was also doing this kind of thing. He wanted to enjoy, you know, he was doing so much charity, wonderful charity he was doing. And he was thinking he would enjoy, but he made a mistake. Unknowingly, he gave one cow away, which he'd already given to another brahmana. And as a result of that, he had to suffer the sin of stealing from a brahmana. So like this, of course, then Nriga Muni, Nriga, he had to take birth as a lizard in a well. He had to suffer. So that's the danger with these kind of activities, karma kandi activities. All right. Oh, we can have somebody read the other text. Text 2, 3, and 4. Someone like to read for us? Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I ask one question? Yes. Uh, Maharaj Nigra, uh, the example that you mentioned, he gave the lizard. He gave the lizard. Uh, he gave the cow uh, to the Brahmans. So that was for his uh, sense gratification. He gave the cow to the Brahmana for his sense gratification. Huh? Yeah, I am, I am. I am having this doubt actually, Maharaj. What? So this Brahman, uh, the, the Brahman were given the uh, cow uh, by Maharaj Nigri because of which he became a lizard. Uh, there was some. So he gave it for basically a karm uh, karm kant ritual. Well, he was giving charity. He would yeah. gi give the cows in charity to Brahmanas. He was giving many cows in charity to the brahmanas. It's a very high level of charity. To give a cow in charity to a qualified person like a brahmana is a very high level of charity. And so he gave cows in, to the brahmana in charity, but somehow by mistake one cow which he'd given to one brahmana was later on given to another brahmana. And so the brahmanas complained that you gave this cow to me. But then, Maharaj, uh, uh, there was uh, not any intentional uh, mistake of Maharaj Nriga. I mean, what was the uh, I mean, uh, wrong thing which he did because of which he became a lizard? In Be the well? Because he gave the same cow away to another brahmana. He didn't do it intentionally, but still he had to suffer the reactions. The two brahmanas were not happy. They, they, they understood. They, the Brahmana said, you give the cow to me, then you give it to another, the same cow to another person. That's like stealing from a Brahmana. And that's what happened. That's why he got the body of a lizard, because he was considered guilty of stealing from a Brahmana. He'd already given the cow to a Brahmana, and then he took it and gave it to another Brahmana. So it was like he stole the cow from a Brahmana. So Maharaj, this is basically, he, uh, this Maharaj Niga, he was a, uh, I mean, he was following this Karm Kandik ritual or he was basically, I mean, uh, I mean, this, this, I could not understand and relate the context of Maharaj Niga with uh, the Gram Edi. You could not understand what? The context of example of Maharaj Niga with the Gram Edi, which we are discussing in this uh, 3.32.1. Well, I'm, I'm describing the danger of performing karma kandi activities. Okay, so this charity uh, of giving cows uh, to brahmanas is part of the karma kandi activities? Yes. Okay, okay, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. It depends, of course. It, it can be done in devotion, but he was doing it as a karma kandi activity. He desired to enjoy the result of the charity. He actually had a strong desire to go to heaven and to enjoy material opulence in his next life. So he was per giving that charity. Now you may give cows in charity to a brahmana in pure devotion. That's a different thing. But he was not doing it in devotion. He was doing it to enjoy the results. Yes, yes, Maharaj. So he wanted to go to heaven by uh, giving cow to uh, brahman. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, some, now we're, I wanted somebody to read text 2, 3, and 4. Yes, so, somebody can read, please. 
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Yes, Maharaj. Text 2. Such persons are ever bereft of a devotional service due to being uh, too attached to sense gratification. And therefore, although they perform various kinds of sacrifices and take great vows to satisfy the demigods and forefathers, they are not interested in Krishna consciousness devotional services. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes. Text 3. Such uh, materialist, uh, materialistic persons attached by sense gratification and devoted to the forefathers and demigods can be elevated to the moon where they drink an extract of the soma plant. They again return to this planet. Text 4. All the planets of the materialistic persons, including all the heavenly planets such as the moon, are vanquished when the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari, goes to his bed of serpents, which is known as Ananta Shesham. Shesham. Text 5. No, no, that's okay. Text 4. Thank you. All right, so the Karma Kandi was described in those verses. How they're attached and they desire their own elevation in the material world. They don't actually desire to go back to Godhead. They simply worship the demigods and they desire to enjoy the fruit of their piety. All right, so we're going ahead. Next we hear about the Nishkam Karma Yogi, described in verses 5 to 7. Superior to the Grihamedis. We were just hearing about the Grihamedis, are those who perform their work with detachment, dutifully in purified consciousness, free from a sense of proprietorship and not swayed by sensual desires. So you can see the difference between the Grihamedi and uh, this Niskam Karma Yogi. They're detached. They do the activities as a sense of duty, with pure consciousness. They don't think themselves to be the proprietor, quite different from the Grihamedi. The Grihamedi is thinking he is the proprietor. And they're not swayed by sensual desires, unlike the Grihamedi. So such detached workers can be divided into two groups, Niskam, Karma Yogis and Bhaktas. Both, they're both detached. You see, one is the devotee and the other is the Niskam, Karma Yogi. A subtle distinction between the two. Not a big distinction, but subtle distinction is there. The Bhakti Bhaktas, they're devoted to the Supreme Lord Krishna. The Niskam Karma Yogis are just simply detached and they're doing everything out of duty. By Niskam Karma Yoga, one gradually approaches the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the path of illumination through the Sun Planet. The sun planet being one of the heavenly planets, you see, is on the way back home, back to Godhead. So the Niskam Karma Yoga, he gradually approaches Krishna. He gradually goes back to Godhead. But devotee, the bhaktas, they can go back quickly. Devotees, however, are quickly taken back to Godhead by the Lord himself. All right, so nice comparison there between the devotee and the Niskam Karma Yogi. Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I ask one thing? Okay. Uh, Maharaj, uh, you mentioned that there is a subtle distinction between uh, Niskam Karma Yogis and Bhaktas. So you mentioned that Niskam Karma Yogis, they do uh, the uh, karma act, uh, activity as a part of their duty and Bhaktas, they do the uh, activity for, uh, for serving the Supreme Lord. So is this correct, Maharaj? Yes, yes. And uh, you also mentioned that Nishkam Karma Yogi, it approaches the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the path of illumination through the sun planet. So this I could not understand, Maharaj. 
But of the Niskam Karma Yogi, he's not going straight back to Godhead. He goes up to the higher planets, goes up to the heavenly planets. The sun planet is on the way back home, back to Godhead. It's on the way out of the universe. So he has to go step by step. You see, he goes up to the sun planet. The sun planet, of course, is fire. And so in the sun, he goes there in his subtle body and he gets purification, further purification before he goes back to Godhead. Because without having devotion, he can't go back to Godhead. He has to have devotion to go back to Godhead. So his subtle body is actually, uh, his subtle body is basically, uh, is actually uh, dissolved in, in sun planet and he gets purified. No. Subtle body is not, the subtle body is not dissolved. The subtle body goes up, takes him up to the sun planet, but it gets purification on the sun planet. Okay, so he's purified, he's basically uh, getting exposure to devotional service on the sun planet. Yeah. Well, before he can go back to Godhead, he has to cultivate devotion. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. And generally, we, we, just a minute, just a minute, just a minute, I'm not, I'm not finished. Another subtle distinction between the karma yoga and the path of devotion, the karma yogi thinks, I'm doing this, I'm giving this. But the devotee understands everything is Krishna's. The devotee doesn't think anything belongs to him. Although it's mentioned here that there's the, uh, the Niskam Karma Yogi free from a sense of proprietorship. So, but there is that tendency among the Karma Yogi to think that I'm doing this for Krishna, I'm doing this for Krishna, I give this to Krishna. Whereas the devotee understands everything belongs to Krishna. All right, yes, Prabhu has another question. You have a question, Prabhu? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Uh, apologies for interrupting earlier. Um, Maharaj, so, you know, the third planet in the middle and obviously seven higher planetary systems. So you were mentioning that the sun planet is one of the heavenly planets. So I wanted to find out at from what point uh, does the heavenly planet begin? Is it from the sun planet? And is that the first higher planetary system above Earth? Well, the sun is one of the higher planets. It's mentioned here that there's a path, a path of illumination <laughs> described like that, that you go up to the sun planet where further purification takes place. Then after going through the sun planet, then you can go out through the coverings of the universe into the spiritual sky. Please, can you turn off your microphones if you're having a lot of background noise there, please? So you go up through the sun, from the sun planet, then you have to go up through the different coverings of the universe. So this is a path by which the yogis generally go out of the spiritual world. So the sun has its own orbit, it's one of the heavenly planets, one of the higher planets, and it's convenient for the living entities who are going out of the material world that they go first to the sun planet for further purification and then they go out through the coverings of the universe. Of course, there are many higher planets. We know there's a, a, a Bu, Buvar Swar, so Swarga Loka is there, and then above that then you have then Mahaloka, Tapaloka, and Janaloka, and Satyaloka. These four higher planets are all there. And some, we heard that there's the people who worship the Haranyagarbha, they go up to Brahma Loka and they stay at such or, or such a Loka, they stay up there with Lord Brahma and they may go back to Godhead with Brahma. 
But other ways, just to go up through the sun planet, and from the sun planet then you can go through the coverings of the universe. So this is one of the paths out of the material world. Okay, we'll go ahead. Here, here's, the, here's the Haranyagarbhas, the worshippers of Haranyagarbha. Haranyagarbha can mean Lord Brahma, but in this case it means Garbha Dakashaya Vishnu. Right? So perfect yogis, the worshippers of the Haranyagarbha, verses 8 to 10. Worshippers of the Haranyagarbha, Garbha Dakashaya Vishnu, do not approach the Lord directly in Vaikuntha. They remain in Brahmaloka until the final dissolution of the universe, and then may be, may be transferred with Brahma to the spiritual sky. So not, we should understand not all, the, it's not every time that Brahma does go back to Godhead. Sometimes, usually he does, but if he has, still has material desires, he will enter into the body of Mahavishnu, and, and then when the creation takes birth again, he will again take birth and he may become Brahma again. So, it, it's... Uh, not absolute that Brahma all go, all, that all the Brahmas go back to Godhead. There are many Brahmas, as you know, many, many Brahmas. And they're not all able to go back to Godhead. They're not all pure enough to go. So then they enter into Mahavishnu, and then when the creation takes birth, then it takes place again. Then they also come out of Mahavishnu. So the worshippers of Garbhadakishaya Vishnu, they have to go up to Brahmaloka, the topmost planet in the universe, and they have to wait there for the dissolution of the universe. That's the end of Brahma's life. And Brahma, you know, Brahma lives a hundred years. And one day of Brahma, Sahasri Yuga Paryantam Aharya Brahmanovidu, that one day of Brahma is a thousand ages, a thousand Divya Yugas, one thousand cycles of the four yugas in one day of Brahma. And then there are thirty days in a month and twelve months in a year, and Brahma lives one hundred years. So you can imagine how long you may have to be there in Brahma Loka before you go back to Godhead, before there's a dissolution of the universe. So it, it, it's a long, it takes a long time, that's the point. Perfected yogis also attain Brahmaloka and are unable to directly enter Vaikuntha or merge in the Brahma Jyoti. So perfected yogis, they can go up to Brahmaloka, but because they have no bhakti, they cannot enter into Vaikuntha. And they may simply have material desires, they simply want to enjoy their yoga perfections. And so then they will not even merge into the Brahma Jyoti. They'll simply stay in the material world. And when the universe is annihilated, they will also enter into the body of Mahavishnu. So that happens, great yogis, sometimes the four Kumaras, sometimes that happens to them. Since they remain in the material atmosphere, all these exalted souls risk taking birth again. So this is a problem, you take birth again, birth again. You don't solve the real problem of birth and death, you're having to take birth again in the material world. So the real mission of life is not achieved. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, sorry to interrupt, may I ask a small thing? Okay. Maharaj, you mentioned something about four Kumaras. I could not understand about four Kumaras. They did not go to uh, the to the uh, Vaikuntha? Well, sometimes they don't go. The point, so, the point is, even if you're Lord Brahma or you're one of the four Kumaras, if you don't have pure devotion, you don't go to Vaikuntha. Yes, Maharaj. So, so four Kumaras, uh, they, uh, but we understood that they, uh, they took the aroma of the Tulsi leaves offered to the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord and then they became devotees. So that, that means... That was one time. Okay, that was one time. But there are other. 
there's, there's other four Kumars in every different place, different universities in different places. Okay, like Brahma, different yeah. Brahma. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Okay, could someone read this for me? What does it say? Contrasting what? Uh, sh shall I read, Maharaj? Okay. Uh, contrasting bhakti with other prescribed Vedic paths after describing the followers of different spiritual paths and the results they achieve, Kapil advises his mother, Therefore, my dear mother, by devotional service, take direct shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is seated in everyone's heart. All right, so we heard from Lord Kapila, he described about the Sakama Karma Yogi and then the Niskam Karma Yogi. And we heard about some of the mystic yogis and so on, that, that, that they didn't solve the problem of birth and death because they lacked devotion. So Lord Kapila is instructing his mother Devahuti that you have to take to devotional service. That is the, the real solution. And how to, t how to do devotional service? Take shelter of that, of the super soul who is seated in everyone's heart, who is, of course, the super soul, who is the, he's the expansion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so that was described. You know, we spoke earlier about Astanga Yoga and meditation on the super soul, which is all part of the Sankhya Yoga system. Okay. Transcend transcendental loving relationships. From text 11, purport, Lord Kapila advised his mother that she did not need any indirect process. Indirect processes means like, you know, you do some karma yoga, or then you come to jnana yoga, and then you may come to dhyana yoga and then back, like the yoga ladder, going through the yoga ladder or indirect processes, you know, worshipping demigods and then coming to worship the Supreme Lord. So Lord Kapila told his mother, you don't need to do any indirect process. Why not? Because she was already situated in that direct process because the Supreme Lord had taken birth as her son. Actually, she did not need any further instruction because she was already in the perfectional stage. Can you understand? Devahuti was already perfect. Why? Because she sees the Supreme Lord and she, she thinks of him as her son. Although he's actually the Supreme Lord, she's thinking Lord Kapila is her son. And so the, the, this was her loving relationship with the Lord. So this was her direct uh, process. She said, already a devotee. She doesn't need to do anything else. One who is a devotee who is doing devotional service, they're not lacking anything. They don't have to do anything else because it's already there within devotion. We, we, you've learned that before in Bhakti Shastri, that when you did the yoga ladder, you saw that one who is a devotee, or what does Krishna say at the end of the sixth chapter? Who remembers what's that verse at the end of chapter six of all yogis? The, the one who meditates on me, uh, his heart always and uh, worships me, with, uh, um, is the best of the yogis. Yeah, do you know the Sanskrit? Maybe Yogina Mapisarvashan, Madgatera Nitaratmanam. Now I don't remember, sorry. Shradaban? Shradaban Bajatari Umar, Sam Yukta Tavamata. Yes, right. Okay, you got it. Yes, one who is the topmost yogi. He's already on that platform. He doesn't have to do any of the other, the other things. It's already included within bhakti yoga. One who's a bhakti yogi, he's already a karma yogi, a jnana yogi, a dhyana yogi. All of these things are already there within. Okay, now uh, we're going to hear a little bit from the Brihad Bhagavad Amrita. 
Any of you have read that book? How did, what's the title? All paths lead to the same goal. Something like that. Not wishing to hear of one, the result of great devotion to Lord Gopikanta, and two, the Lord's pastime place above Vaikuntha, and not fully understanding them in her heart, she asked Sri Pariket. By performing auspicious duties, householders with material desires can achieve the three worlds, and persons who have renounced their homes can reach the four worlds beyond those. However, when their enjoyment ends, all these persons return to this mundane earth. Only a select few of those who have reached the planets of Maharloka and other higher planets become liberated with Lord Rama. Sanatan Goswami explains that the three worlds are Bhu, Bhuvaha, and Sva planets. Householders in those realms wish to enjoy the fruits of their work. Householders who have no material desires by performing prescribed duties may go to Maharloka or other higher planets, and when their hearts are pure, may become liberated. Persons who are not householders are Naishtika Brahmacharis, Vanaprasts, and Sannyasis. The four realms they attain are Maharloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka, and Satyaloka. They who have material desires again take birth, but they who have no material desires and act only out of duty are liberated. Some persons, after enjoying on Archir Loka and other planets, gradually attain liberation. Renounced souls devoted to transcendental knowledge quickly attain liberation. The Lord's devotees who have material desires may enjoy by fulfilling those desires. And when they become fully purified, they also attain the Lord's abode. Devotees having no material desires at once attain the blissful spiritual realm of Vaikuntha, which is difficult even for liberated souls to attain. Pure devotees living in Vaikuntha enjoy forever in varied ways the happiness of directly serving Sri Krishna's lotus feet. In comparison, the nectar of liberation appears insignificant. Some of those devotees are situated in knowledge, jnana bhaktas. Some are pure devotees, shuddha bhaktas. Some are devotees situated in love, prema bhaktas. Some are devotees situated in great love, prema pura bhaktas and some are overwhelmed by love, prematura bhaktas. Sanatana Goswami explains that here, four and a half kinds of love are described, with the jnana bhaktas being the half. The devotion of jnana bhaktas is mixed with a desire for knowledge, not the pathetic liberation of the impersonalists, but the awareness of the glories of serving the Lord's lotus feet. Maharaj Bharat is an example of a jnana bhakta. The Sura bhaktas are devoted to the nine processes of devotional service. Their devotion is not distracted by fruitive work, a desire for knowledge, or non-devotional renunciation. Maharaj Ambarish is an example of a Sura bhakta. The prema bhaktas want only to serve the Lord's lotus feet with love. Hanuman is an example of a prema bhakta. The prema para bhaktas are the Lord's affectionate associates who by the Lord's boundless mercy are tied by the chains of affectionately gazing at the Lord with longings of love, friendship with the Lord and close friendship where they joke with the Lord. The Pandavas are examples of 
prema para bhaktas. Obtained without love for the Lord, there are varying degrees of that love. Thus, the prema bhaktas are better than the shuddha bhaktas. The prema para bhaktas are better than the prema para bhaktas. Since the levels of these devotees vary, it seems unfitting the results they achieve be the same. Nonetheless, no one is considered better than anyone else in Vaikuntha. It follows that among devotees in Vaikuntha, there is equality even to special Vaikuntha perfections, such as living near the Lord or attaining a form like His. A goal higher than Vaikuntha is each according to his own kind of love and each attaining his own object of love. Everyone is happy, have all attained the highest happiness. I still wonder, however, what is the destination of they who are devoted to the Lord who performs the Rasalila? My heart is not happy if others attain the same destination attained by loving devotees who chant the holy names and who, indifferent to all material goals, yearn to become Shivrata's maidservants. I cannot tolerate that others attain the same destination as Nanda and Yasoda and their associates. Okay. So I, I hope that had some aroused some interest in you, and you can you may like to read Brihad Bhagavatamrita yourself. As you see, this is from the first chapter, the second section, first chapter, verses ten to twenty-two, describing different devotees in the spiritual world. It's not all the same. There are different levels of devotees, different degrees of devotion, according to their mood. So, although they're all there in Vaikuntha, but they, they enjoy different relationships with the Lord. Maharaj, may I ask a question? Uh -huh. uh, can you explain the last um, verse we, we just heard? He said, uh, it was said, I cannot tolerate that others achieve the same uh, yeah. destination as Nanda Maharaj. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's leading to the inquiry that there's another planet beyond the Vaikuntas, you see, that that is Goloka Vrindavan. There's this very special place called Goloka Vrindavan where these very special devotees are who enjoy that particular rasa with Krishna. So why why does he say I cannot tolerate? Well, she just thought it's not fair. That it, it doesn't seem just that there's people who have the the desire for a higher relationship than what's there in Vaikuntha. So she wasn't aware of Goloka. So that's the point. So the Sanatana Goswami is writing like that in his book. Oh. He's describing that. You see, mm -hmm. so he's introducing to us. And to, to the Uttara who was inquiring like that, it was Uttara who was inquiring from Maharaj Parikshit, and she was inquiring, it doesn't seem fair, that what about the, those devotees who attach to something higher? Hare Krishna Maharaj? Yes. Uh, may I ask one thing, uh, Maharaj, with your kind permission? Well, you can ask. Yeah, Maharaj, actually, uh, like in this couple uh, shiksha, these chapters, we are understanding that uh, the material desires they lead to bondage, and uh, these material desires, like for name, fame, and uh, uh, like in Hindi, they say like lab puja pratishta, like name and fame. So, uh, like the, these desires are there in the subtle, subtle uh, body. So, though we have the knowledge, though we are studying Srimad Bhagavatam, though we are understanding that these material desires are so dangerous that they can uh, bring us back into the material world or maybe into the hellish regions. So then with this knowledge, why uh, actually, I, if I talk about myself, why I am not able to get rid of these uh, unwanted material desires, Maharaj? 
with I have the knowledge, but still I am struggling, and still I am not able to give uh, give up these desires for name and fame and respect. No, you have to follow the process more, right? It's going to take some time. You have to take up the process with increased enthusiasm. And if, if you desire to actually get rid of them, then you can. It's, the process is there. You've got the perfect process to get rid of these desires. You just have to follow. And gradually you will. We are talking about anartha navritti, right? You want to get rid of these desires, these subtle desires. This is all anartha navritti. So you have to do it through the medium of devotional service. So by absorption in devotional service, gradually you get rid of these desires, and these desires will become less and less as you continue. Yes, Maharaj, but sometimes what happens if we are following the process of devotional service for, uh, let us say, for a long period of time, and still uh, we are not able to find uh, much improvement in the level of the desires, and sometimes it is disheartening. And uh, like we cannot measure our level like to what degree uh, the desire has been reduced. The desire is still existing and still we are following the process of uh, devotional service sincerely and enthusiastically and uh, consistently. But the result seems to be little far away, little far away so that sometimes it spoils the motivation level. So, Well, you, you have to just you can't be so attached to the results, you see. You have to be humble. You have to tolerate. You have to understand that we've been in the material world a very long time. And you say we're practicing. How long are you practicing? How long have you been in the material world? We've had many, many births in the material world. So our conditioning goes very deep. And so we should regret. We should lament. But we should feel very fortunate that we're on the right path. Now we just have to continue, we just have to keep going, hold tightly to the lotus feet of Krishna and spiritual teachers, and gradually, gradually, one day you'll go back to Godhead. Gradually it will happen. Don't think it's going to happen overnight. It's not just so quick that, oh, take up chanting Hare Krishna and it will all happen. No, it's going to take time. You've been, we've been in the material world a very long time. So you have to be patient. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, we'll go ahead. Here's Srila Prabhupada. Would somebody like to read this for me, please? What's the heading? The process of pleasing Krishna. Okay, go ahead. Any language you should submit and you should feel that, that I am worthless. My Guru Maharaja has given this chance to serve Krishna, to offer Krishna. My Lord, I am worthless. I have no capacity to serve you. But on the order of my Guru Maharaj, I am trying to serve you. Please do not take any offense. Accept whatever I can do. That's all. That is my request. That mantra is sufficient. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yome Bhaktiya Prayachati. Krishna never said that. One who offers me, offers me with Sanskrit mantra. Oh, sorry, wait. Go ahead. Yome uh, bhaktiya prayachati. Real thing is bhakti, feeling, how to serve Krishna, how to please him, that is wanted. Not to see that you are a very good scholar in speaking in Sanskrit or English or that. That is not. Always feel that I am worthless, but I have been, by the grace of my Guru Maharaj, I have been given the chance. So kindly accept whatever little service I can give. I am offensive, so kindly excuse me. In this way, be humble, meek, and offer your feeling, and Krishna will be satisfied. Yes, I think that's very good. I think you should remember this. In yeah, Maharaj, uh, Maharaj, may I request, like, may I see the previous slide once again, because that was, I think, very relevant to my question. I think the slide came uh, immediately, uh, what you already answered, that you said that we have to be very, very humble, because I do not have any capacity to serve. It is only by the mercy of the spiritual teachers that we can uh, try to uh, serve Krishna. Yes, right. Okay, so there's the slide. 
Yes, you're right. Humility is very important and we should feel ourselves unqualified and worthless. But at the same time we should feel very fortunate. We're trying to serve Guru and Krishna. I am worthless. By the grace of my Guru Maharaj, I've been given the chance. So kindly, whatever little service I can give, please accept. I'm offensive. Kindly excuse me. Be humble. Meek. Offer your feelings. Krishna will be pleased. All right? Go ahead. What, what's the title? Shall I read Maharaj or some other devotee will like to read? You, go ahead, you can read. Okay, okay. Without Bhakti, no one can enter the spiritual sky. All those who maintain self-interest are forced to come back to the material world. Yes, self-interest. We were speaking about even Lord Brahma, the four Kumaras. If they are self-interested, they come back. Keep reading. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, without bhakti, no one can enter the spiritual sky. My dear mother, someone may worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead with a special self-interest. But even demigods such as Lord Brahma, great sages such as Sanat Kumar and great munis such as Marichi have to come back to the material world again at the time of creation. When the interaction of the three modes of material nature begins, Brahma, who is the creator of this cosmic manifestation and who is full of Vedic knowledge and the great sages who are the authors of the spiritual path and the yoga system come back under the influence of the time factor. They are liberated by their non-fruitive activity and they attain the first incarnation of the Purusha but at the time of creation they come back in exactly the same forms and positions as they had previously. Yes. So this is being described here, you see. Great sages, even demigods like Lord Brahma, sages like the four Kumaras and Munis like Marichi, they may come back to the material world. They enter into the Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu is the first incarnation of the Purusha. And they stay in the body of Mahavishnu. They stay in the subtle form. In the subtle form, they're in the avyakta stage and they remain in the body of Mahavishnu but then when the creation takes place then they come out, they take birth and they will take that position again. <laughs> okay, Maharaj, yes? Maharaj, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, where, where we can characterize a devotee which is uh, performing devotional service, and but the, he want uh, to please himself by the devotional service before the Lord. Like, uh, uh, for example, we are we sh we shall go for the to the temple on programs to to glorify the Lord like this. But devotee, for example, cho choose that. Okay, I will. I doesn't will go for these regular programs, but I will go just for programs which uh, I organize. For example, I do some, I, I organize some kirtans for devotees, so I will go only on these programs. But the other programs, I don't care what is doing. So <laughs> I, I just how how we can characterize such kind of mentality that. No, the, 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 they want to enjoy them. Well, we have to consider what are they doing when they don't go to the program. You know, some, you know yeah, yes. there are people who don't go to the program, but they're very busy with other engagements. Yeah, yes, but I, I, I mean, uh, not that kind of devotees, but especially they when you just choose, you know, uh, that uh, I like that kind of devotional service, so I will do this, but other devotional service I will not do, you know. Uh -huh. I was th thinking in <laughs> how we can characterize, you know, that kind of uh, mood. 
Yes, well, it's very fruitive, you know, it's not very good, is it? You know, thinking, uh, uh, you know, like this, that we should, of course, we should see devotional service absolute. Of course, at the same time, we have to recognize everyone has their particular ability, particular nature. But for everyone, there's hearing and chanting. You no know, hearing and chanting and remembering Krishna, that's for everyone. We can't say, you know, oh, I don't like to hear, oh, I don't like to chant. Everybody has to do that. You may not like cooking, you may not like kirtan, okay, but, you know, I mean, there has to be some kirtan. You have to, you have to get some taste for kirtan, the chanting of the holy name. And the one devotee said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, I don't like to go to class. He said, I, I've, I, I know everything which they're, what they're saying. He said, I know everything they're saying. I don't learn anything new. So then Prabhupada said to him, they said, then you should give class. He said, if you know everything they're saying, why don't you give the class? So, I <laughs> like that, you know. Prabhupada definitely wanted us to go to the program. But we have to understand also sometimes there's different programs going on. And nowadays we do have also Wi-Fi. So you can be in the house, you can be taking part in the program. You may not be in the temple room, but you can be attending the program in your house with the Wi-Fi connection. Right? Thank you. So we're tolerant about these things, you know, and uh, we try to, you know, don't worry so much about others, just try to be a good example yourself. That's a good thing, you know, if you can go to the program, that's very nice. And don't, don't worry too much about others. They're not coming to the program, it's their problem. But example. That's the best way to teach everyone. If we get people to be a good example for others, very nice. Okay, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur's commentary on these verses. In the Gita, the Lord says, Mam eva ye prapadyante mayami tam tarantite. Right? Evihyesha gunamayi mamma maya duratyaya. Right? Those who surrender to me cross over my Maya. Bhagavad Gita 4.11. From this it is understood that even Brahma does not get liberation if he does not have bhakti. So You want to surrender? You want to get liberation? We have to have the qualification. Qualification is devotee. We surrender to Krishna. If we surrender to Krishna, then we can cross over the Maya. But if we, we have not got devotion, then we won't be able to get through. What has been described here are Brahma, sages, yogis, jnanis and kumaras who are devoid of bhakti in some particular universe. The Brahmas and sages of all other universes have bhakti and thus attain liberation and prema bhakti with dasya and other relationships according to their degree of bhakti. All right, so I was speaking about this, that we have to under, when we speak about Brahma, the four Kumaras and like that, we have to understand that there's many of them in all the different universes, and there's many universes. And so, some of them don't have bhakti. They don't have bhakti, they don't get to go back to Godhead if they're without bhakti. Um, 
Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, in the previous slide, there was one thing about surrender. May I ask Maharaj? Yes. I'm sorry Maharaj, I'm having a lot of queries. I'm very really feeling very sorry that I am bothering too much actually. Um, but I have some basic uh, questions like uh, in the when we are basically there are six, six symptoms of surrender that we understand that Lord is our supreme protector. But when there is a problem in the life, we feel that we cannot solve. Then we, I feel that, okay, if Lord is a supreme protector, then why is he not giving the protection? So how to understand that we have to surrender by uh, having in our consciousness that Lord is our supreme protector. And when some problem comes which we cannot solve with our uh, intelligence or mind, then we feel that God is not giving any protection. So God is the supreme protector in every stage of life. Yes, well, we have to understand that protection is there, but it's not that God is just there as your order, as your servant, you know. The protection is there. Pro the protection is that he's, he's in, the, in our heart as a super soul, and he's giving us knowledge and remembrance and forgetfulness. He's helping us to come to him. He's guiding us. He's telling us what we need to do. It's not that he's going to come, you know, or, or, or right, you're, Pral you're Prahlad Maharaj and the Lord's going to come as Nishringa Dev and kill the demon who's giving you trouble. And, you know, it doesn't mean like that, that every time the Lord will come and kill the demon who's troubling you. But protection means that he's there to help you to stay away from Maya. He's helping you, he's helping us, he's guiding us to surrender, to come to closer to Krishna, to move towards Krishna and not to move to Maya. So that's the protection. Definitely the, the, we can feel the protection of Krishna when we surrender to him, as we, as we, when we take the shelter of Krishna. When we take the shelter of Krishna, then we will feel his protection. When we chant the holy name and when we fix our mind on Krishna, we will feel the difference and we can understand how he's taking care of us and helping us. But he does say, as you surrender to me, I reward you accordingly. So it depends on the quality of our surrender. The devotee is reluctant to take service from Krishna. Not that every day we pray to Krishna, oh, protect me, oh, Krishna, I'm in you have to do this for me. No. Sometimes, sometimes you, a devotee is very reluctant to approach Krishna for service. We want to give service to Krishna because we see Krishna has taken so much care of us, has been helping us so much. So a devotee is very reluctant to approach Krishna for service. And it has to be a really life-threatening situation before we would even think to call out to Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay. We'll go ahead. So, yes, somebody read. What does it say, Prabhu? 16 to what? 16 to 22. Go ahead. Lord Kapila criticizes Sakama Karma. After describing those who are dedicated to Nivarta Karma in 5 to 7, Kapila advises to surrender to the Lord in 3, 22 and 21. After describing those dedicated to Pravarta Karma, the Lord again advises to just worship the Supreme Lord with devotion. Okay. So Kapila advised to surrender to the Lord in text 21. So those dedicated to pravrita karma, the Lord again advises just worship the Lord with devotion. Going to do it. The Nivrita Karma, 
they're, they're different people. This is pavrita karma. They're dedicated to pavrita karma. So just worship the Lord with devotion. The nivrita karma people, they're, oh, you know, they're just, don't do this, don't get that. And they're more avoiding things. They just want to get out from the material world. They do things as a sense of duty only. So pavrita karma is definitely better. Just worship the Lord with devotion. Just surrender to Him. Yes? Someone read? 22 to 26, conclusion of Lord Kapila's teachings. My bhakti goals of other paths, my bhakti goals of other paths are also achieved. 22 23, jnana and vairagya quickly achieved by practice of bhakti. 24 25, symptoms of a devotee. 26 one, Bhagavan is perceived differently through different processes. <laughs> All right, so this, this is some conclusion of Lord Kapila's teachings, right? If we do devotional service, then all the other paths, the results of all the other paths are also there. And we had already, we remember, the, there's a famous verse there from the first canto, second chapter, that simply by doing devotional service, you automatically develop Gyan and Vairag. Gyan, spiritual knowledge, and Vairag, detachment from whatever is not in relation to devotional service. So Gyan and Vairag follow Bhakti. And then 24 and 25, the symptoms of a devotee, the different good qualities of a devotee will develop. By doing bhakti, the devotee will naturally develop all of these qualities without even thinking about it. Just by engaging in the process of devotional service, the different qualities develop. Then text 26, one Bhagavan is perceived differently through different processes. There's one Supreme Lord, but someone perceives him as a Brahman, Someone perceives him as Paramatma and someone as Bhagavan. Mm. We'll, we'll see the example. The conclusion of Kapila's teachings, verses 22 to 26. This is one of the concluding verses from Kapila's teachings. My dear mother, I therefore advise that you take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, for His lotus feet are worth worshipping. Accept this with all devotion and love, for thus you can be situated in transcendental devotional service." So Lord Kapila, again advising his mother, just do devotional service. The lotus feet of the Lord take shelter of the Lord's lotus feet and you'll get all the results. Text 23 and you can see very similar to the word from the verse from the first canto second chapter. Vasudevi Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojita Jnana Yajasu Vairagyam Jnanam Yat Brahma Darshanam. <laughs> Little change at the end. Engagement in Krishna consciousness and application of devotional service unto Krishna make it possible to advance in knowledge and detachment as well as in self realization. So, if we're engaged in Krishna consciousness, doing it, do, doing our hearing and chanting, practicing all the principles of devotional service, then certainly we will be cultivating our knowledge and detachment. And 
self-realization will also result. But remember, the goal is none of these things. The goal is to develop love for Krishna. We want to develop love for Krishna. We don't just want knowledge and detachment. We don't just want self-realization. We want to develop a love for Krishna. We want to become deeply attached to Lord Krishna. That is the goal. Text 24. The exalted devotee's mind becomes equipoised in sensory activities and he is transcendental to that which is agreeable and not agreeable. Some, you know, some people are like that, oh, this is good, this is not good, oh, I like that, I don't like this. So agreeable, not agreeable, that's a material platform. That's the platform of the mind. A bala, a manda, a sabram. We're thinking this is good, this is bad, this is all the business of the mind, it's all illusion. So we have to transcend that. We have to transcend that. And the devotee is able, his devotee means he's transcendental, he's transcendentally situated. He's not disturbed by sensory activities. He may use his senses, but he uses his senses simply for devotional service. We don't stop the senses like the jnanis and the yogis. We use our senses in the service of Krishna, not anything else. Then text 25, because of his transcendental intelligence, the pure devotee is equipoised in his vision and sees himself to be uncontaminated by matter. He does not see anything as superior or inferior. And he feels himself ele elevated to the transcendental platform of being equal in qualities with the Supreme Person. All right, so devotee, the pure devotee is being described that he has transcendental intelligence. And so because of his transcendental intelligence, he is equipoised in his vision, the, how we see everything. How are we seeing it? If we're not equipoised, we will see, oh, I like this, I don't like that. Oh, this is good, this no good. Oh, yeah, I want that, I don't want this. The equipoise. So he's controlling his mind and his, he, 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 with his vision, he's careful not to judge, and not to make criticisms of others. But he wants to see everything in the proper way. How to see? We talk about Shastra Chaksus. We should see everything through the eyes of the scripture. See everything with spiritual vision. Don't just depend on our own eyes to see things, but see through the eyes of the scripture. And then it says also, sees himself to be uncontaminated by matter. Although we may have a material body, we don't think we're the body. We're living in the body and we're all pure souls. So that the pure devotee understands, I'm a soul, I'm a pure soul, uncontaminated by matter. He does not see anything as superior or inferior. Some people on the bodily concept of life, they think, oh, I'm high class, they're low class, oh, I, this person has no class, they make distinction. They're, they're not seeing with, in the proper way. So they, they, they make judgments based on their material vision. So that's not proper. Now he feels himself elevated to the transcendental platform of being equal in qualities with the Supreme Person. Yeah, we have, we're one in quality, but different in quantity. We may have the qualities of the Supreme Person, but not in the same quantity. So qualitatively one, but not quantitatively. And that way we, we keep our individuality. We're tiny sparks 
and the Lord is the fire. And in text 26, the personality of Godhead alone is complete transcendental knowledge, but according to the different processes of understanding, he appears differently, either as impersonal Brahman, as Paramatma, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, or as the Purusha Avatar. So, different processes will reveal the Lord in different ways. If someone takes to the impersonal process, the process of Gyan, speculative knowledge, they will conclude the Lord is the impersonal Brahman. And if somebody is following Astanga Yoga, they will conclude that the Lord is the Paramatma. But for the devotee of the Lord, they can understand the Lord as Swayam Bhagavan. Or the Purusha avatars. We heard about people who worship the Haranyagarbha like that. So some people worship the, the Mahapurush or the Purusha avatar. These are also devotees, of course, they have the devotion, but they may, they're not necessarily going to be Krishna Bhaktas. They may be worshipping Vishnu as the Supreme. So, Maharaj, yes? Maharaj, you mentioned about Jnanis and Yogis. So, Yogis are more closer to Bhagwan uh, than compared to Jnanis. Uh, like, they also merge in the uh, uh, Brahmjyoti, but they are more nearer to Bhagwan. Is this correct, Maharaj? Why? Well, I don't quite follow what you're saying. The Yogis are closer to Bhagavan? Yeah, yog Yogis, uh, like, since they are... Uh, having the realization of Paramatma, but uh, the destination, like the destination of uh, Jnanis and Yogis uh, is both uh, Brahm Jyoti, but in Brahm Jyoti also, he may be uh, like, uh, the uh, Jnani may be on the external side of uh, Bhagwan realization, but Yogi may be little closer to the Bhagwan realization side. Mm, it depends. We have to see, you know, there are different kinds of yogis. Some yogis, they simply want the astasiddhis. They simply want material perfection. You have to consider what is their realization, how much they've understood the nature of the soul. Have they actually understood that there's a super soul? Sometimes they think we are the super soul. They think, the yogis often think there's only one soul. They don't understand that there is also the super soul. And they think when they're meditating on the super soul that they are the super soul. Yes, Maharaj. So basically, based on their consciousness, uh, they, like they may be wanting siddhis or personal benefits, then again, they yeah. may fall behind. They have material desires. That's the point. They have material desires. Bhukti mukti siddhi kami sakale ashanta krishna bhakti niskam sa ishashanta. Right? Somebody, the jnanis, they want liberation, mukti, and the yogis, they want siddhis, and the, the karmi, he wants sense gratification. So, bhukti, mukti, siddhi, kami, sakali, ashanta, none of them are peaceful. Whether they're nearer or not, understand they're not peaceful. Yes, Maharaj. That's the main point. That yes, Maharaj. But they haven't got complete realization of the Supreme Lord. Thank you, Maharaj. All right, then verses 27 to 36, we get a summary of Lord Kapila's teachings on chapters 25 to 29. Attaining Bhagavan realization is the ultimate goal of all Vedic practices. So it doesn't matter what process you're following, the ultimate goal is to realize Bhagavan. So this is the conclusion of Lord Kapila's teaching. We want to understand that properly, that these jnanis and yogis and karmas, karmis and whatever process they're following, that they should go on to realize the Bhagavan feature. Mm. So... 
here you can see the review of what we've been covering in this Kapila Shiksha. Chapters 20 to 24, you heard about Devahuti and Kadama and the appearance of Lord Kapila. And then Lord Kapila's teaching actually began in chapter 25, where he spoke about bhakti, essentially bhakti. And then chapter 26 was on jnana, and 27 was about the jnani, app applying that knowledge and how he can achieve liberation. Chapter 28, we heard about the Astanga Yoga, and then 29, we heard about four different kinds of bhakti, that there was bhakti in the gunas, and there was also pure bhakti. So four different kinds of bhakti. And then we went, oh, okay. So, recapping, astanga, jnana, and bhakti. From verses 27 to 36. First of all, detachment from matter is the common ground for all transcendentalists. So whether one is a personalist or impersonalist, whether one is a yogi or a jnani or whatever, it doesn't matter, that they all have to show this detachment from matter. It's a primary consideration for achieving the transcendental platform. If one is going to come to the transcendental platform, one has to be detached from matter. You have, we have to give up that attachment to the material. So that's an, uh, an important point in all the different processes. If we, if we are keeping attachment, then we cannot progress. We have to let go of the material in order to actually come to the transcendental platform. And then, by mental speculation, devoid of devotion, one cannot come to a positive understanding of the Supreme. So mental speculation, that is the ascending process of knowledge. Trying to pull oneself up, trying to understand the Lord by the power of our own mind and senses then it will be very difficult and it will be very troublesome to make advancement. The path of devotion is a descending process, the knowledge comes down. But mental speculation, we're trying to pull ourselves up. You know, if you ever climb a rope, if you go rope climbing, it's much easier to come down than it is to go up. You have to work hard to pull yourself up. It's quite easy to come down. And so similarly, to try to understand the Supreme by our own efforts is very difficult, very, very difficult. Vedeshu Durlabham, right? To understand everything by the Vedas and like that, then very difficult, very rare. Or by Gyan, we say Gyan, Bahunam Gyanmanamante, Gyanavam Mampratpajante. After many births and deaths, when one is actually in knowledge, then he surrenders to me. Such a soul is very rare. So that's the process of Gyan. Gyan means mental speculation. So you make advancement very slowly, many births, and very rare to come to perfection. But by devotion, it's very easy. The path of devotion is a positive way to understand the Supreme. Third point, directly or indirectly, one should come to the same goal, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So directly, we give Devahuti as the example, directly. That just by devotion, her devotion for Lord Kapila. She has devotion. She doesn't need to do anything else. She's already got devotion for Lord Kapila. She doesn't have to worry about how to get devotion. Indirectly, then, we, we, we're, going, we're taking up different paths. Maybe worshipping demigods, maybe uh, studying the Vedas, maybe the impersonal path, coming to the impersonal Brahman, and then going on to Paramatma, and then Bhagavan, like that, indirectly. 
indirectly, going up to Brahmaloka, waiting in Brahmaloka for the end of Brahma's life, and then going back to Godhead, that's indirectly. But directly, can immediately go back to Godhead. So it's the same goal. The goal is the personality of Godhead. Only by devotion one can understand the Absolute Truth. Just as only by the tongue one can experience the taste of milk. This is a very nice example to be understood. Just like the taste of milk can be perceived by the tongue. You know, milk, it, it has its own smell, it has its own touch, it has its own uh, appearance, but the way you can actually tell if it's really milk is with the tongue. So similarly, only by devotion can we actually understand the absolute truth. To know the truth in full, it's only by devotion. So we, we give this, Lord Kapila gives this example, just like the tongue is necessary to know the taste of milk. You want to know the taste of milk, you have to use the tongue. You can't taste with anything else. You can't taste with the skin. You can't taste with your nose. So it's a special taste which is only perceived by the tongue. 27. Detachment from... Okay, we had that, right? The, the common ground for all transcendentalists. Then 28 to 30. The Lord is the source of everything. Everything comes from Krishna or Lord Kapila. It's all from Him. There's nothing separate from Him. That's also stated, of course, from the Bhagavad Gita. And the same thing is here in Kapila Shiksha. Text 31. Thus I have explained to you about Jnana, realization of Brahman by which one understands the truth about Prakriti and Purush. So we had that in chapter 26 about Gyan. We went through all the different elements about the Prakriti, how they're all manifested. And we heard about the Purusha. Ultimately there's one Purush, the one Purush is Krishna. But we are also tiny Purushas, we are also trying to enjoy. So, realization of Brahman. When we understand Brahman, we will know about the difference between matter and spirit. Matter is Prakriti and Brahman is Purusha. So, we want to understand properly what is, what is matter and what is spirit and who is the controller of both of these things. This is Gyan. All right, you can see here, what's the title? Various what? To realize Bhagavan? Various? Arts. Yes. Various arts. Yes. Yes. Uh, huh? Yes. Ah. Ah. I can't hear what you're saying, Prabhu. It's not clear at all. Various paths. Various paths. Various paths by which to realize Bhagavan. All right, so there's Krishna in the center, and you can see the different paths. So one path is by the Veda. You study the Vedas, you can know Krishna. By all the Vedas, I am to be known. Indeed, I am the author, I am compiler of the Vedas. Okay, so some, somebody else, do yajna. The goal of yajna is to satisfy the Supreme Lord. Yajna vai Vishnu. Yajna is meant for the satisfaction of Lord Vishnu. Lord Vishnu means Lord Krishna. And varna, following properly the different duties of our varna. That is also pleasing to Lord Krishna or ashram. We have our different ashrams executing our duties. According to Varna, an ashram will also 
be very pleasing to Krishna and help us to advance. And then Gyan, from the Bhagavad Gita, one who is actually in knowledge will surrender to Krishna, Vasudev. So the goal of Gyan is to come to Krishna. And then Yoga, we quoted, the, the best yogi, the topmost yogi, is the one who is engaged in devotional service, who thinks of me within himself. So the topmost yogi, the yogi Uttama, he is a devotee of Krishna. And tapas, tapasya, austerity, one will do austerity for the pleasure of Krishna. In the fifth chapter, text number 29, we have the peace formula. Bhoktaram yagna tapasam sarva loka maheshwaram. Bhoktaram yagna tapasa. Right? The purpose of all yoga, of all austerities is for the pleasure of Krishna. So that's tapas. And then bhakti. Bhakti is also meant, of course, that's meant for, for Krishna. By devotion, Krishna said, only by devotion am I to be known. Only by devotion am I to be understood. And the goal of that devotion is to come to prema. And there you see prema also. Prema punato mahan. Develop love. Love for who? We want to develop love for Krishna. So all of these different processes help us to realize something, to realize Bhagwan, realize Lord Sri Krishna. Many different processes, but they're all meant to lead us to Krishna. Krishna is a prayojana, right? There's Sambandha, Abhidaya, and prayojana. Uh, the prayojana meaning the goal of all the scriptures. And this famous verse from the second chapter of the first canto, right? Vasudeva para veda, Vasudeva para maka, Vasudeva para yoga, Vasudeva para kriya, Vasudeva param gyanam, Vasudeva param tapa, Vasudeva paro dharma, Vasudeva para gati. In the revealed scriptures, the ultimate object of knowledge is Sri Krishna, the Personality of Godhead. The purpose of performing sacrifice is to please Him. Yoga is for realizing Him. All fruit of activities are ultimately rewarded by Him only. He is supreme knowledge and all severe austerities are performed to know Him. Religion or dharma is, rendered, is rendering loving service unto him. He is the supreme goal of life. So just to support Lord Kapila's teachings, that Krishna is a prayojana. Vasudeva is the purport of the Vedas. Vasudeva is the object of all sacrifices. Yoga, Varnashram, knowledge, austerities are all dependent on Vasudeva. Bhakti is dependent on Vasudeva. Prem and liberation are dependent on Vasudeva. And this is in relation to the example of uh, The example of milk, right? A single object is appreciated differently by different senses due to its having different qualities. Similarly, the personality of Godhead is one, but according to different scriptural injunctions, he appears to be different. So, different ways of, by which we can visualize God, just like we gave the example about milk, you know, milk has its own smell. Somebody just relies on the smell, all right, they can distinguish what is this, what is this thing. Someone else uses their eyes. Someone else uses their hands, the sense of touch. 
So different senses will perceive objects in different ways. In the same way, we can understand God, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, in different ways, according to different scriptural injunctions. We can understand the Lord in different ways, just like you can understand the Lord if we see the, the universal form, then we'll understand the Lord in that particular way. We will think of the Lord as just simply being a form from the universe of all the material elements. And we won't understand the Lord has a transcendental form. And somebody else is a yogi, he's meditating on the super soul. So he simply knows that God, that Lord is in the heart of everyone. And somebody else is a jnani, so he simply knows the impersonal aspect. He simply knows only the oneness of the Brahman. And he thinks ultimately nothing, everything has no form. And God is also without form. Of course, God is also without form, but he also has a form. He's both, he's everything. Prabhupada writes in the Sri Upanishad that God is everything within our experience and beyond it as well. So, like that, here you can see the example, the milk, and how it's perceived differently. Milk has its particular smell and taste and looks particular way. Each of the senses perceive it in a different way. You see the five senses. And so, what is it? When you use the tongue, then you can, you know, oh, this is milk, yeah. But without using the tongue, you wouldn't know. By the eye, milk is perceived to be white. Well, there are many things which are white. And by the tongue, it is perceived as sweet. By touch, it is cool. By the nose, it is perceived as fragrant. By the ear, it is defined as milk. One by one, each perceivable quality is perceived by its particular sense and not by other senses. So each, each of the senses, they understand the milk in its particular way, according to that sense. Just like with the tongue, you're going to understand the taste. With the nose, you're going to understand the smell or the aroma. Each of the senses have a particular way in which it works. It is realized as a possessor of a certain quality by that particular sense, and not as milk itself. But it is perceived by the king of senses, the mind, as something possessing all the qualities. So this is a philosophical presentation of the Sankhya philosophy. A possessor of a certain quality by that particular sense, but not as milk itself. Just that we said, well, many things are white. It has a particular uh, touch. No, no, okay, but there are other things also touch like that. But the mind understands everything, takes all the qualities. Remember we gave the example about the blind man massaging the elephant? So each of the blind men have their own experience, but they're only describing a part of the elephant. Someone is massaging the leg of the elephant, he said it's like a tree. Someone's massaging, he's got the tail of the elephant, he said oh, it's like a brush. Someone has got the ear of the elephant, so it's like a big fan. Someone's at the side of the elephant, said no, it's like a wall. So they're, they're describing different parts, but you have to put the whole thing together, and then you get what is actually the elephant. You can't know the elephant just by one part, by one limb of the elephant. You have to see the whole body. So similarly, all the qualities have to be understood. Then you can actually know what is being described. So one portion of the Lord 
is perceived by karma. And what portion is that? That is swarg, the heavenly planets. One portion, the idea of swarg. And one portion may be perceived by the jnani, that would be brahman or the atma. So they have their different realizations. But Bhagavan, the object of Prem, who includes all the other forms, who gives all the results, that is realized by the bhakta, by bhakti only. Krishna says, only by devotion am I to be understood. Bhakti mama bijanati yavam yas chasmin tanvata. Only by devotion, right? So here you see Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan. Different realizations. Somebody knows the Lord is Brahman, somebody's Paramatma realized, but the devotees know Bhagavan. And one who knows Bhagavan, they also know, they have also knowledge of Brahman and Paramatma. One who is a bhakti yogi, he is also a karma yogi, a jnana yogi, a bhakta, a jnana, jnana yogi. They're all there within bhakti. Just like Lord Sri Krishna, all of his different incarnations, they're all there within the original personality of Godhead, Swayam Bhagavan. Eche samsa kala pumsa, Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam. Right? All of these different incarnations of the Lord, you can see Lord Rama, uh, Lord Kapila, uh, Lord Parasaram, Dattatreya, Varaha, they're all there. They all, they're all there within the original Swayam Bhagavan Sri Krishna. Jai. Krishna Bhagavan Ki. You recognize? Who is this? Which deity is this? Radha Yes. Oh, really? Yeah. Yellow. Yeah. yeah, good. I don't know. Is that Vasan Panchmi? When the Vasan Panchmi, we had yellow garlands. They don't have yellow garland on there. I don't think it could be Vasan Panchmi. The dress is yellow, but the garlands are not yellow. On Vasan Panchmi, the deities had all yellow garlands. It's all yellow flowers. The whole thing was yellow. Okay, going ahead. Kala and Samsa, 37. My dear mother, I've explained to you the process of devotional service and its identity in four different social divisions. I've explained to you as well how eternal time is chasing the living entities, although it is imperceptible to them. So she wanted to know about time. <laughs> Lord Kabila said, it's chasing the living entities, but it's imperceptible. We don't see time, right? We don't see the time moving. Although the sun is rising and setting every day, another day lost and we're nearer death. But we don't see, we don't see the duration of life is being reduced every moment. And so, He's, Lord Kapila explained this. Text 38. There are varieties of material existence for the living entity according to the work he performs in ignorance or forgetfulness of his real identity. My dear mother, if anyone enters into that forgetfulness, he is unable to understand where his movements will end. So this is ignorance. We forget our identity. And then the result is take birth again and again. So chapter 30, we heard about Tamagun, working hard, trying to get money and everything, and then dying a horrible death and taken by Yamaraj to Yamaloka. Then text 31, we heard about Tamas and Rajas, passion and ignorance. We heard about the child in the womb and offering prayers, but then when they come out of the womb, then they forget and they become enamored by the material nature, but so much suffering, struggling for enjoyment. 
trying to get things they can't get. And now today, chapter 32, we're hearing about passion and goodness. Hmm. Trying to enjoy the results of our worship. And we have one more chapter to do. We have to do chapter 33, Devahuti's Bhakti, which we will hear tomorrow. So final section, who is eligible to receive these instructions? Lord Kapila describes, this instruction is not meant for the envious, for the agnostics, or for persons who are unclean in their behavior. Nor is it for hypocrites or for persons who are proud of material possessions. It is not to be instructed to persons who are too greedy and too attached to family life nor to persons who are non-devotees and who are envious of the devotees and of the personality of Godhead. Text 41. Instruction should be given to the faithful devotee who is respectful to the spiritual master, non-envious, friendly to all kinds of living entities and eager to render service with faith and sincerity. This instruction should be imparted by the spiritual master to persons who have taken the Supreme Personality of Godhead to be more dear than anything, who are not envious of anyone, who are perfectly cleansed and who have developed detachment from that which is outside the purview of Krishna Consciousness. So this is Lord Kapila's uh, instructions on who should be given and who should not be given this knowledge of Sankhya. And you can see, quite similar, Bhagavad Gita. And then finally we have the Fala Shruti. This is the fruit, the result. If you follow, anyone who once meditates upon me with faith, and perfection, or, uh, faith and affection, who hears and chants about me, surely goes back home, back to Godhead. So that's the blessings we get from studying Kapila Shiksha. If we have faith and affection, we hear and chant about Lord Kapila, then surely we go back home, back to Godhead. Okay, 33, we'll go on to tomorrow. Any questions? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. <coughs> Maharaj, you know, um, if you look at different situations in this material world, uh, currently Afghanistan, Russia, Ukraine, pensions, uh, we know the only solution in the world is to preach Krishna consciousness and for people to take up Krishna consciousness. Uh, and, you know, whatever is unfolding is obviously due to their karma. But we spoke earlier about, you know, Krishna, seeking Krishna's protection. So I want to find out, you know, as a pure devotee, uh, or, or this is in relation to a pure devotee, when he sees the world, the material world, going through these type of situations, can one pray to the Lord to give them his protection and to give them devotion? What's it? I couldn't hear it clearly, Prabhu. One what? One pray? Uh, Maharaj, from, from what point must I repeat? Well, the, uh, the, the last part, just the last part. Yes, I was speaking in relation to a pure devotee. You know, he's on the transcendental platform. But is it pure devotional service that he can pray to the Lord to give those living entities his protection and devotion. Because, you know, obviously one can't travel there in a due to different circumstances being, being dangerous, for example, or unsafe. But can, a, can one pray to the Lord to give those living entities his protection and devotion to him? Oh, yes, definitely we can pray like that. I mean, we know Vasudev Datta was very much appreciated by Lord Chaitanya. That Vasudev Datta wanted to take the sinful reactions for all the people and let them all go back to Godhead.
And he said, I will stay here and suffer for them. So Lord Chaitanya was so pleased, he appreciated so much, and he declared that Vasudev Datta was in the mood of Prahlad Maharaj. So he had the mood of Prahlad Maharaj, he was thinking about others, he wasn't thinking about his own deliverance. That's very nice. But of course, when it comes to actually preaching, for preaching work, we do make distinction. You know, we have to make distinction. Who is actually able to, who is actually worthy to receive this knowledge? And sometimes, you know, you try to preach to people, they simply become more angry or they become more offensive. So that's not good. We don't want them to commit offences because that will really damage their spiritual progress. So we have to be cautious. We do have to discriminate about who we give this knowledge to. You know, it's one thing to give causeless mercy to people. Lord Krishna can do that. He can give causeless mercy. He can take someone like Putana and he can take her back to Godhead. Or he can take you know, Pondraka, and Pondraka, and he can take him to Vaikuntha and give him a forearm form because he, he's so attracted to the forearm form. He wants to. So he, he, Krishna can do that. But we're not on Krishna's level. At the same time, we can feel compassion for the fallen souls and we should we and we we're encouraged to feel that compassion and to think about delivering them and we do now of course we have programs so many welfare programs distributing prasadam giving the holy name people don't want us out there people often don't want us out there they don't like that we're out there chanting or giving out food and so on but we do it anyway right so we, we have to, you know, at the same, at the same time we, we have to be a little sensitive to a situation when it comes to actually giving spiritual knowledge, it, to instruct the glories of the Holy Name to faithless persons is one of the offences in chanting the Holy Name. So that's something which we have to be conscious about. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Yes? Uh, Maharaj, may I ask one question? Please do, Prabhu. Uh, yes, uh, Maharaj, actually, suppose uh, if there is some uh, problem in the mind which is blocking the flow of devotional service, then how should we pray to the Lord? Uh, I mean, what is the effective prayer for the Lord that if there is some problem and that is affecting the mind and mind is not getting engaged, in the devotional service like it was earlier before the coming of the problem. So how should we pray? Because you also advise that we should not uh, take service from Krishna, we should do service for Krishna. But sometimes the mental situation is like that, that uh, it is uh, having some uh, like blocker, uh, some hurdle is coming in execution of devotional service. Well, we have full faith in the holy name, chanting the holy name particularly the Maha Mantra. You know, Prabhupada certainly wanted us to chant the Hare Krishna Mantra. He didn't worry so much about other mantras. He wanted the Hare Krishna Mantra. He propagated the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mantra. And if we simply take shelter of the Hare Krishna Mantra, that will actually it can solve all the problems. That is the panacea for all mental problems. The loud chanting of the Holy Name the Maha Mantra, loud chanting will help us to overcome the obstacles of the mind. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. So we, we, have that, we have to have that faith in the chanting of the holy names. You know, this is what Prabhupada chanted. Lord Chaitanya also propagated the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mantra. And so, yes, it's, of course, that it, Prabhupada writes in Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's also Hare Harai Nama Krishna, Yadavaya Namaha, Gopal Govindaram, Sri Madhusudan. Prabhupada said that's also a Maha Mantra. You can chant that. Yes, Maharaj, in the morning uh, prayers that is also recited. 
No, oh, good. Yes. So, the mind, of course, the mind is stubborn. <laughs> How to do it? We just have to, we have to, a constant practice and endeavor. It's not going to be easy, we know. And we know the problem of the, the, the mind. It's a problem. Even Arjuna had trouble with the mind. But, you know, by constant practice and detachment, we have to cultivate that detachment from the material. Why is our mind giving trouble? Often material attachments, we're holding on to something. We have to, we have to hold on to Krishna. You know, the Buddhists, the Buddhists they, they want to let go of everything. They say, don't hold on to any, but we say, give up the material, hold on to Krishna. The more we hold on to Krishna, then we'll let go of the material. And so, Savaimana Krishna Padara Vindaya, fix your mind on the lotus feet of Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. Sometimes it helps just to meditate and to look at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna and see the different marks on the lotus feet of Krishna and think about the significance of these different items on Lord Krishna's lotus feet. You know, there's that, there's that gold which is used for controlling the elephant. So our, yeah. mind, our mind is like the stubborn elephant. So that's one of the items on the lotus feet of Krishna to control our stubborn mind. And there's a thunderbolt also, because our mind, in our mind there's a mountain of dirt, and that thunderbolt will shatter the mountain of dirt. Yes, Maharaj. So, uh, it, it's, it's quite helpful to do that, to contemplate the different symbols on the lotus feet of Krishna. And then there's a couple of, there's different nice verses which you like, you can pick up, you can select for yourself. Nice verses? Uh, yeah, and diff different verses about the power of the holy name and the chant and, and how we can conquer the mind, you know. Yeah. So, there's, there, there are many verses. At the end, at the end of the prayers by the personified Vedas in the tenth canto, you know that? Prayers by the personified Vedas, that chapter? Yeah, yes, yes, Maharaj. In the tenth canto, it's a very big chapter. It's near the end, it's almost the last chapter of the tenth canto. And then there's a verse there at the end of the chapter which is very good to recite. Prabhupada told us to wake the children up in the Guru Kula in the morning by reciting that verse. It begins, Jayati Jana Nivaso, Devaki Jana Nivado, Yadavara Parshad, Swayar Dorbira Sana Dharmam, Stirachara Vrijanagna, Susmita Sri Mukena, Brajapura Vanitandam, Vardayan Kama Devam. That Lord Sri Krishna is he who is known as Jananivas the ultimate resort of all living entities. He is also known as Devaki Nandan and Yashoda, the son of Devaki and the son of Devaki and the, or the son of Yashoda. He is the guide of the Yadu dynasty and with his strong arms he kills everything inauspicious. By his presence he destroys all inauspiciousness for all living entities moving and inert. His blissful smiling face always increases the lusty desires of the gopis. May he be all glorious and happy. And then there's another wonderful verse which, come, which you'll come across tomorrow, which is spoken by Devahuti about the power of the holy name and how the holy name actually it removes all parabda karma. Parabda karma is a problem, right? We've got all this bad karma and our, but the things in our mind, the, the, the parabda karma. So it's all destroyed by the chanting of the holy name. Yannamadeha shravana nukirtanad yat pranavad yat smaranad apikachit vadyopisadya shravana yakalpate kutapanas twam bhagavan nudarshanat. Right? Devahuti is speaking about the chanting of the holy name. That even one time chanting the holy name, 
It can make a person, even if he's born in a family of dog eaters, he becomes immediately qualified to perform the Vedic Yajna. If he just simply once chants the holy name, or hears the glories of the Lord, or bows before, bows to the Lord, he becomes immediately qualified. So this destroys all the Prabhda karma. This is a verse to show the power of devotional service, that all of our Prabhda karma can be changed, it can all be removed just by one stroke of devotional service. So you have to engage your mind in reflecting on these things. You see, keep the mind always busy in the thought of Krishna. That's why we are training the devotees to memorize these different slokas. You know, you should be reciting them continually, and reflecting on them within your mind. Don't reflect in your mind on the past and things which happened in the past. Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, forget the past which, which sleeps. It sleeps, it's gone, it's finished with. And ne'er the future, dream at all. But live with times which are with thee, and progress thee shall call. Right? Yes, Maharaj. So this is the problem. We, we start hankering and lamenting. We're hankering about the future, we're lamenting about the past. That's the business of the mind. We have to transcend the mind. You have to get off, off the mind, off the platform of the mind. So use the mind to contemplate Krishna, Savaimana Krishna, Padara Vindar. The first thing, fix the mind on the lotus feet of Krishna. Yes, yes, Maharaj. Okay, yes. Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Any other questions? Asaf Prabhu, your hand is up. Do you have any questions? Yes. It's one question about. Um, um, when the uh, uh, Devahuti, um, you said about Devahuti that she was already already liberated because she thought of the Lord as her son, because Kapila then appeared as her son. And but actually, in in the beginning of Devahuti's uh, story, we hear that she is um, uh, serving very humbly and. But then she wants, she has material desires. So I was just uh, wondering whether she, she got the, she actually had the, the, the desire to, to have the Lord as her son, or is that simply, or not simply, but is it uh, purely the mercy of Karda Mamuni that he bestowed upon her, even without her willing? Well, we're not actually told, I think it's more the mercy of the Lord Himself, that the Lord Himself chooses where He will come, where He will appear. So he, the Lord Himself chose to come as the son of Devahuti. So, so if, I, if I think of it as a um, causeless mercy of the Lord because of, of, the, of His pure devotee, Kaldam Amuni, is that um, uh, a fair... Uh, as, as you said, Maharaj, it doesn't specify. Well, Kardamamuni, he'd gone, right? He, he left home. He, he'd gone off for his perfection. Uh, well, we could say Kardamamuni, but generally we would say Devahuti. It's more in relation to Devahuti because he chose Devahuti to give the teachings. He didn't choose Kardamamuni to give the teachings. It was Devahuti who got the Sankhya Yoga. Kardama Muni gone. But Lord Kapila is there to give this Sankhya Yoga to, Kap to Devahuti. So she's the one who really got the, the mercy. So it's, it's the Lord's causeless mercy ultimately. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. We'll be hearing more about Devahuti tomorrow. That's, of course, the subject of the tomorrow's chapter, the Devahuti's condition, her position. Okay. Any other questions there? All right, so we'll meet tomorrow. 
to finish this Kapila Shiksha. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go back to Vrinda Ki. Jai. Hare Krishna.